Welcome to the British Museum's third ever audio described talk. I'm Fiona Slater and I'm the Equality and Diversity Manager at the British Museum. And it's really nice to see uh, you all attending today. You can see the numbers kind of steadily rising, so that's great. I'm going to give a very brief introduction to you and then I'm going to hand over to uh, Shushmit Ansari and Di Langford from Vocalize, who are going to be taking you through this this event, this audio described tour. Um, first off, just to explain what this event is and what an audio described talk is. So you're going to have a selection of objects which are from room 33, the South Asia collection. And Dai is gonna give some uh, beautiful visual descriptions of each of these objects. And Shushma is going to give us her kind of expert um, background information from a kind of curatorial um, viewpoint. So. We've got those, it's going to be a kind of in conversation between the two of them. And uh, we did normally, or usually pre-lockdown, just pre-lockdown actually, in March uh, last year, we ran this event as a live tour for a small number of uh, blind and visually impaired audiences in the museum. Um, obviously, the museum is closed now and we're not able to do it on site, but we have um, moved it online, which means that we can open it up to you know, more audiences and we've got capacity to host more of you from all across the world, so that's great. Um, I think that's about all from me. Uh, just to say, we're all at home, so we're all in our respective homes from sort of uh, living rooms uh, and we're all um, not actually at the museum, like I said, it's closed at the moment, but we're delighted to be joined uh, with you in your home. So at that, at that uh, point, I'm gonna hand over to Dai and Shushma who are going to take us through um, this uh, audio described tour. So I'll hand over to you now. Hello and welcome. My name is Di and I'll be your visual interpreter this afternoon. Our tour takes place in room 33, the Sir Joseph Hotung Gallery. It's the largest gallery in the British Museum and it's recently been refurbished. It measures 115 metres from one end to the other, and if that is hard to imagine, it's as long as a football pitch, so pretty large. The main entrance is halfway down on one side, so as we enter the vast and airy space, it stretches away from us to right and left. Now, at the moment, there's a picture on the screen which is just half of the, value, of, of the gallery. It's twice as long as that. The gallery isn't just long, it's wide and high and very brightly lit and it has windows all along the far side opposite the entrance. There are huge square pillars supporting the roof. In between the pillars there are large bays with mahogany and glass cabinets on either side containing the exhibits. And down the centre of this wide gallery other sculptures are displayed on freestanding modern plinths. In the middle of the room and immediately opposite the entrance is an unusual architectural detail. It looks like a low wall of smooth pale, green, pale cream stone. It's circular and about waist high with a wide flat top. As you approach it, you realize that this circular wall is surrounding a large hole, several meters across. It's like a round window in the floor. This is called an oculus. It's like an eye looking down onto the ground floor below. So people coming into the museum through the rear entrance in Montague Place are visible from above, and light from this gallery floods down into that space as if through a circular skylight. And some visitors coming in look up and see people staring down at them. To the right of the oculus, the pillars are painted dark red, and the exhibits displayed here present the history and culture of China. To the left, the pillars are a striking peacock blue, and this is the South Asia section where we will begin our tour. So Shushma, can you tell us more about this part of the gallery and what we're going to be talking about today? Hello, yes, I definitely can. It feels very different to be doing this um, by video from home rather than in the gallery, which we did last time. Um, but I'm really glad we're doing it. So today we're going to be sharing seven fantastic objects with everyone um, from ancient sculptures to a gold coin, hooker bases and even a modern shadow puppet. I curate the ancient to medieval South Asia collections as well as most of the, most of the 
ethnographic collections. So I've sort of emphasised um, objects from this broad period of time for our tour today. I worked with colleagues actually to create a completely new narrative for this gallery and redisplay all of the collections. And previously, the gallery took a broadly thematic approach and we shared uh, the collections through the indigenous religions of South Asia. But the new approach that we worked on is a slightly more chronothematic. There are a range of themes picked out in the different sections. And for example, there are things like Indo-Roman trade or the life of the Buddha, architecture of a stupa and many, many more. The South Asia section begins with the earliest history of South Asia, one and a half million years ago in the Paleolithic, and it ends in the present day in a case that includes, among other objects, Ravi Shankar's sitar. The ancient to medieval period is on the side next to the huge windows, so this is opposite you as you would enter the gallery. And this is because the gallery, those huge windows flood the galleries with light, and the ancient to medieval objects that survive tend to be mostly stone, metal, um, and perhaps terracotta sculptures, and so they're not light sensitive. The opposite side of the gallery is much darker, and this deals with the medieval to modern period, and it's not only darker, but very carefully lit, so it's um, possible to display light sensitive material like prints, paintings, and also the shadow puppet that we're going to share right at the end of our tour today. So we're going to start at the beginning of the gallery with a statue of a Hindu god. An image of our first object was used to advertise this event on the museum website. It's a statue of a very important Hindu god called Shiva. It comes from Tamil Nadu in southern India and it dates back to about 1100. It's about 90 centimetres high and it's made of bronze. It's a dark brown metal with a greenish tinge. Shiva is a very powerful god. He's a lord of creation and also of destruction. And he's depicted in many ways. This one is the most famous, Shiva Nataraja, lord of the dance, enclosed in a circle of fire. It's not a solid statue. It's framed by an open circle about 70 centimeters in diameter. It's three centimeters thick, like the rim of a wheel and there are 23 small flames projecting out at regular intervals around the edge of it. Each flame is about five centimetres with a, a jagged edge, which gives the impression of flickering. The statue is supported on a small circular base decorated with stylized lotus flowers. Shiva is dancing in the middle of the circle. He's facing us with both legs bent. All his weight is on his right foot and his left leg is thrown across his body as if he's in the middle of a movement and about to spin round. In this particular statue, Shiva is shown as a slender young man with a serene expression and a slight smile on his lips. His almond shaped eyes are closed and in the center of his forehead, he has a vertical third eye. He wears a tall decorative headdress in the shape of a huge flower and his hair flies out on either side. It's like braided dreadlocks reaching right to the edge of the circle. And tangled up in his hair on the left is a tiny image of the goddess Ganga, who personifies the river Ganges. We're going to ask Shushma to tell us more about that in a minute. Shiva is naked, except for a loincloth and a large amount of jewellery. He has huge earrings, a necklace, anklets and bracelets, and a jewelled belt, and a scarf around his waist which flutters out to the edge of the circle. There is a lot of movement in this statue. He also has four arms, and each hand holds an object or makes a specific gesture. Two of his arms are bent at the elbow, and they're held out to left and right. One hand holds a flame, the symbol of destruction. The other holds a two-sided drum, shaped like an hourglass, it's quite small, and that's to summon new life. The third arm has a snake wound around it, and the palm is facing forward while the fingers of the fourth hand are directed towards the ground. This draws our attention to Shiva's bare feet and the fact that he seems to be standing with all his weight resting on what looks like a baby wearing a nappy. Of course, it's not a baby. It's a small figure with a stocky body and short fat limbs wearing a loincloth, not a nappy. He's lying on his front with his legs tucked underneath him. His face is turned towards us, showing very coarse features. 
This is Apasmara, the extremely dangerous dwarf demon who represents ignorance or lack of spiritual insight. Unfortunately, Apasmara is immortal and cannot be destroyed. Even all-powerful Shiva is only able to subdue the demon and keep him under control. And so that's how he's portrayed here, held down firmly under Shiva's foot. Now, Shushma, why does Shiva have a third eye? Good question. Um, so Shiva's third eye is actually interpreted in a range of different ways. Um, for example, the eye that looks inward, um, which would be a representation of seeking inner knowledge, or that it represents, for example, his all-seeing nature. Um, but you'll actually notice, I mean, if you really zoom in to this sculpture, you'll notice that this, um, in this sculpture, Shiva's third eye is very firmly shut. And in the context of the Nataraja, this is to prevent its fiery power from destroying all creation. And that is the very creation that he's destroying and bringing in to being again and again and again. So it, it's quite a... It's quite important that the third eye is closed at this point. Why is Ganga, who represents the river Ganges, why is she tangled up in his hair? So if you look very closely, um, you'll see that the goddess Ganga is nestled in a lock of Shiva's hair. Um, and it's right at the top of the sculpture. So it's not, you know, tangled up in the middle of his hair or at the bottom of, of all of his dreadlocks. Um, and it, that little bit of hair actually looks like it's curling up and around. So it almost resembles um, maybe turbulent water or a wave. And Shiva actually caught her in his hair to break um, Ganga's, the river's thunderous descent from the Himalayas, which threatened to destroy the earth. So that's why she's gently nestled and caught in, in his hair at the top. That's a really interesting story. And I love the way that the lives of the gods and the goddesses are so intertwined. We're going to meet Ganga again later on in our tour. Well, we're going to move on now to um, the next object, which is the Matura Lion Capital. Now, this object dates back to the first century AD and it comes from Uttar Pradesh. That's the area of India where the Taj Mahal is located. So if you've ever visited the Taj Mahal, you would have been to Uttar Pradesh. It's known as the Mathura Lion Capital, and it was created about 100 AD, and it would have been displayed on the very top of a column. It's about 34 centimeters high and 52 centimeters wide. It's sculpted from mottled pinky red sandstone, the same color as an earthenware flower pot that's been out in the garden for a while. At first sight, it resembles one lion with two heads, but further investigation reveals it's actually two crouching lions. They're not realistic, they're very stylized, but they're both lying with their bodies side on to us. One is lying in front of the other and its head is to the left. One haunch of it is visible, its back legs are tucked up underneath and it has a tail curling forward. The second animal is lying in a similar position, but it's behind the first one with its head to the right, so the body of that one is partially hidden. Their faces are almost identical. They're almost square and turned towards us. They're tipped at a slight angle, one to the left and one to the right, which gives them quite a quizzical expression. There's a hint of a mane curling down the back of their heads. Their ears are small and pointed and their eyes protrude slightly above a flat nose. Each lion has a mouth like a narrow slit. It's very wide and it stretches right from one side of its face to the other. And in the middle of the mouth, just visible, there's a little tongue peeping out. To be honest, they don't look particularly fierce. And supported on their joint backs is a rectangular section, half of which is hidden between them. Facing front and visible to us is part of this section, which is about 20 centimeters square. It's carved with a Buddhist symbol, which resembles a plant with curving tendrils. The back of the sculpture isn't carved. It's flat and covered in writing, which is inscribed into the stone. Apart from the lion's faces, this writing covers all the surfaces of the capital, including the underneath of it, where there is also a hole for a dowel to be inserted to fix it to the top of the column. So even though the writing wouldn't be visible from the ground, it would be high up, it was obviously important enough to be inscribed all over the sculpture. Now, Shushma, in the gallery, there's a photograph next to the capital of an elderly man wearing a turban. 
He has a thin face and a little drooping moustache. Who was he? Yes, do you know what? I, I, I thought it was really important to include his photograph in the gallery and, and that's why um, I suppose we're also talking about him here. So this is a picture of Bhagavan Lal Indraji and his dates are 1839 to 1888. And he was an Indian archaeologist and epigrapher from Gujarat in Western India. He was employed by Bhau Daji Lad and his dates are 1824 to 1874. So they were all, this is the 19th century, the colonial period. And Bao Dajilad was a physician, scholar, and collector who's based in Bombay, now Mumbai. For, and, and for over a decade, he actually funded Indraji's visits to archaeological sites and archives to read and document inscriptions in situ, while also conducting excavations and reading and translating manuscripts. And it was actually during this time that he unearthed the line capital in Mathura, and also when he translated manuscripts of, and this will be unexpected, the Kama Sutra into Gujarati, which formed the basis of later translations into English. So when you have heard of, you know, Richard Burton, who apparently translated all of this stuff, or well, the first person to have done that, and the work on which later um, translations are based, is actually the work of Bhagavanal Indraji. Now, Indraji collected coins, manuscripts, sculptures, copper plates and stone inscriptions during his travels and his work. And he bequeathed the Matura Line capital to the British Museum, along with his uh, collection of coins. Um, and actually, they, he also presented his manuscript collection to the Royal Asiatic Society of Bombay and his books to the Bombay Native General Library. So they're actually now spread um, across multiple institutions in two different countries. Um, but he's such an important figure, but often so overlooked that I thought it was a good idea just to contextualise this particular sculpture in this way, not only in the gallery, but also during our talk. What was the uh, writing, recording, and, and who actually put it there? Because you're not going to be able to read it from the ground. So um, what does it say? Um, so actually the capital, as you mentioned, it dates to about AD 100, and it was discovered by Indraji in 1869. And it's inscribed all over in Prakrit, which was a North Indian vernacular language of the time. And it's written in the ancient Karoshti script. And the inscription's really very interesting. It records the donation of a monastery and apparently a Buddha relic by Yasi Kamui, who's the main wife of Rajavula, the Indo-Scythian Indo great governor. And so this is a donation by a woman who clearly has enough um, wealth and resources to endow an entire monastery and donate a Buddha relic. And the other part of the inscription um, also records a gift of land by Sudasa, who's Rajavula's son. So just, just gives you a bit more information about um, this inscription, also how important it is. And also, I suppose, it takes you past this slightly, um, you'd assume that maybe the, the sculpture was donated by a man and it recorded, you know, deeds by man, but actually no. When you start reading these inscriptions, there's a lot more to um, these stories, and I think they, they do a lot to challenge stereotypes as well. Well, you mentioned a, a Buddha relic there, and our next object is a statue of the Buddha. Who was he originally? So, according to tradition, um, before he became the Buddha, or the Enlightened One, he was simply Siddhartha Gautama. He was a prince born to Queen Maya in a garden in Numbini, and he enjoyed a very nice royal upbringing. He was shielded from pain and unhappiness, and he, you know, got married when he'd grown up. But actually, when he saw human distress in the form of an elderly person, a sick person, and a corpse, he decided to renounce his luxurious lifestyle and to seek enlightenment. And by doing so, it's liberating himself from this endless cycle of birth and rebirth. And it was only after he subjected himself to austerities, very harsh austerities, that he decided to abandon asceticism for the moderate, the middle way. And after entering deep meditation, he attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree at Bodhgya. And it's from this point on that you can call him the Buddha, the enlightened one. And now we have a stone sculpture of the Buddha preaching. It was carved in Pakistan in AD 2 to 300, and it's 95 centimetres high, 53 centimetres wide, and 24 centimetres deep. The figure is carved from a stone called schist, which is a greenish grey. It has several different minerals in it, including tiny flecks of crystals, which catch the light. 
An interesting aspect of this sculpture is that the head and the hands are almost life-size, but the rest of the body isn't. Now, I didn't even notice that, and I'm supposed to be looking for all those sorts of details. Someone pointed it out to me, and I think it just doesn't look out of proportion, which is it's so interesting. It's a statue of the Buddha preaching his first sermon following his enlightenment. He is now in a state of inner peace and wisdom, so he has every reason to look serene, which indeed he does. He has a smooth face and his hair is drawn up onto his head. It's gathered on top of it into a bun like a cottage loaf. He has well-defined eyebrows and his eyes look half closed or at least his lids are lowered. There's a raised circular dot on his forehead and that's his third eye and obviously that one this time it's open. He has a flat nose and a small mouth with well-shaped lips. His ears are long with a slit in each earlobe where he would once have worn heavy, valuable jewellery, but obviously he's cast all that aside. And behind his head is a large round halo about 50 centimetres in diameter. He's wearing a monk's robe, which it's not a made up garment, it's unstitched clothing. The drape of the fabric is finely sculpted. It has a curved neckline and it covers his arms to the wrist. Then it falls into a semicircle where it loops down over his legs and they're crossed in the lotus position so the soles of his feet will be facing upwards. There's just one toe peeping out under his robe on the left. His arms are bent and his hands are close together with his fingers arranged in a gesture symbolising the wheel of Dharma which represents the Buddha's teachings. He's sitting on a cushion with tassels and the cushion is on a low stool with carved legs. The sides of the Buddha figure have been carved, but not the sides of the stool or the cushion. The statue would probably have been installed in a shrine and it might have been painted or gilded. And despite its age, it is in good condition. There's slight damage on the edges of the halo and on the corner of the stool where he's sitting. And Shushma carved just at the bottom underneath the stool, there's a little group of figures. In comparison with the Buddha, they are much less detailed. So who will those people be? It's a good question. A lot of people miss that bit. So at the centre, there is a seated bodhisattva and he's flanked by a man and a woman kneeling in prayer. And a bodhisattva is a being on the threshold of attaining enlightenment, but who has delayed becoming a Buddha um, to help others on the path uh, to enlightenment. So a very important figure in Buddhism. And you can see behind these three figures, you can see a man and a woman standing behind behind them and they represent the donors of this culture to a buddhist stupa or a monastery and actually where they survive and um, you often see donor figures on the basis of large stone buddhist sculpture from gandhara and just to explain you know, what is gandhara uh, what does this word mean um, gandhara is an ancient province centered on the peshawar valley in modern day pakistan and it also the greater gandhara also extends into modern day afghanistan it was located on the Silk Roads, which connected South Asia with East, Central and Western Asia. And Gandhara also refers to a school of Buddhist art in this, re in this region. And this sculpture of a preaching Buddha is an example of Gandharan art. Now, Buddhism may have arrived in Gandhara from India in about the third century BC, and it flourished here in Gandhara from about the first to fourth centuries AD. And many monasteries and stupas, which are relic mounds, were founded at this time. And these monuments were first embellished with donated locally produced stone sculpture made from schist, as you've described, and later with stucco, which is very fine plaster sculptures, which were then painted. So that just gives you a bit more context about this sculpture and also the, the the, the importance of those donor figures on, on the base. Well, we're going to move on now um, to the fifth century, to the Gupta period. Can you introduce the Gupta period and empire to us, Shushma, please? Of course, yeah. Um, so the Gupta empire um, and the Gupta period is generally um, thought of as AD 320 to 550. But those sound very definite, um, but actually it's a little bit more fluid than that. and. This empire included uh, much of northern and central India and under Gupta patronage, you know, courtly culture and the arts really flourished. So the empire itself is said to have reached its peak under Chandragupta II and he ruled between AD um, 376 and 415 AD. And during this period, you know, several, and I mean the Gupta period broadly, 
very important Sanskrit texts, including the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, which are India's epic poems, they took the shape that we broadly know today. Um, court playwrights such as Galidas, incredibly famous uh, Indian uh, poet and playwright, they wrote their masterpieces and mathematicians such as Aryabhata flourished. Um, in terms of religion, Buddhism continue to thrive across India, while cults dedicated to Vishnu, Shiva and Shakti, they grew in popularity. And depictions of these deities were elaborated and formalised, and many freestanding stone and brick temples were dedicated to them. And it's important, I think, I mentioned this, because actually these were the earliest freestanding constructed temples in India. So I hope that gives you a very broad overview of, of the period that the, the coin that we're going to look at um, fits in, sits in. The museum has a collection of coins from this era and we have chosen one to describe. It's a Gupta gold dinara. This is a gold coin minted in India between 415 and 447 AD. It's very shiny and it's also very tiny. It's only about 18 millimeters across. The nearest modern coin I could find to compare it with is an American one cent piece, really small. This coin shows an image of a king, Kumara Gupta I. Now, it's not just a picture of his head. There is a whole drama being played out on here. He's even in a costume. He's wearing a decorated coat and trousers. He's riding a horse caparisoned in ornamental trappings. The horse is facing towards the right. The king is sitting upright on its back and his right arm is bent and he's holding a long sword which is aimed at a large animal on the ground. It's quite difficult to make out all the details as the coin is so small, but the animal has short stubby legs, a large body and a head that um, could be a pig or maybe a wild boar. And it also seems to have a horn and its hide seems to have separate sections like armor plating. Of course, it is a rhinoceros which the king has hunted and killed. And the inscription on the coin reads, ever victorious is the Lord Kumara Gupta, protector by the sword from the rhinoceros. And there's more, turn the coin over and on the reverse of the coin is a woman, we met her before, tangled up in Shiva's hair. It's Ganga the goddess of the river Ganges. She's standing facing left. She's just wearing lower garments and lots of jewelry. Gods and goddesses have a vehicle on which they travel. Under her feet is Ganga's vehicle. It's a Makara, which is a mythical water creature like a crocodile with a long snout that turns into an elephant's trunk. And it's holding in its trunk a lotus, which it is offering to Ganga. And there's also a tiny figure holding a parasol over the goddess. And the whole image is surrounded by a border of dots. It's amazing how much detail there is on this tiny coin. Now, Shushma, did all Gupta kings depict themselves on their coins doing improbable things like hunting rhinoceros? That's a really good question. Um, actually, when you look at images and inscriptions on Gupta coins, you notice that they tend to emphasise martial prowess, uh, religious links, courtly culture, which I mentioned before as well. Um, so if a Gupta king isn't you know, shown wrangling a rhinoceros, then he might be shown maybe hunting a lion or playing a musical instrument. Um, in terms of Kumara Gupta, there's another really beautiful uh, coin of his and it shows him feeding a peacock and that sounds you know quite a peaceful kind of activity you feed a peacock in your grounds maybe but actually it's quite warlike because the peacock, peacock is the vehicle or mount of the war god Gardik so it's a very strong connection with warfare once again even when you might not anticipate that given the imagery I think it's important that you have to decode the imagery on a coin to really understand what's going on so Although I wouldn't say that they're always going to show themselves doing improbable things, they are certainly doing things that at the time are considered very kingly. And I've also noticed that um, a lot of these sculptures have a lotus flower connected with them, which I believe is regarded in many different cultures as a symbol of enlightenment and regeneration, because even when the roots are in deep mud, the lotus produces the most beautiful flower. Yes, no, it's an interesting one because actually when you look at a lot of um, sculpture 
from South Asia, and it, do, it doesn't necessarily have to be religious sculpture or religious artwork. The lotus flower is almost always there. Um, it, it's a really is you know whether it's folk art, um, the sculpture, you know, um, stone sculpture, metal sculpture. That the deities are often shown standing on an open open lotus. So yeah, it's a really very important um, image. Yes. And uh, we're now going to go on to object number five, which is another goddess. So this is Tara, the Buddhist goddess of compassion from Sri Lanka. This sculpture dates back to between the 8th and 9th century AD. She's very tall, nearly one and a half meters, that's of, and about three quarters life size. She's 44 centimeters wide and 30 centimeters deep. She's one of the most popular Buddhist goddesses, and she's displayed at the far end of the gallery. She is an impressive figure, standing on a plinth, looking down at us. Now, this statue must have been commissioned by a very wealthy donor as it was cast in solid bronze, and then it was gilded. And despite some corrosion, the figure still retains a rich luster. Her face is oval, with a serene expression, and her hair has been plaited up into a tall, intricate column. In the middle of it is a medallion, well, now it's an empty niche, where a model of the Buddha might once have been displayed. There are small holes around it to contain jewels, and her half-closed eyes would have been set with precious stones, and she would have worn more jewels in her long ears. Tara has an hourglass figure. Her upper body is naked, and her large breasts have prominent nipples. From here, her body narrows down to a very small waist and curves out to shapely hips. Fastened around her hips, she wears a garment like a sarong. It's tied with a ribbon which falls to the hem. It's not quite ankle length, and the fabric looks very fine, almost transparent, as it clings closely to the shape of her long legs underneath. Tara is barefoot, and unfortunately she's lost some of the toes on both feet and the tips of some fingers on her right hand. Her right arm is slightly bent at the elbow, with the hand held out and the palm facing towards us in the gesture of giving. Her left arm is bent up, with her hand just below shoulder level, and the tips of her fingers are close to her thumb, as if at one time they might have been holding a flower. Tara would have been displayed in an inner sanctum of a temple and probably seen only by a favoured few people as a focus for meditation rather than worship. Shushma, I mentioned that she had sustained some damage and yet a lot of the gilding has survived. What happened to her? Yes, that's quite right. Uh, she's an incredible sculpture, incredible survival. Um, solid cast in bronze, then gilded, as you mentioned. And originally, as you also mentioned, the medallion in her hair and her eyes would have been set with a figure of um, the, the Buddha um, and also potentially with stones as well. So you can imagine the immense cost of commissioning the sculpture of Tara and also the incredible skill required. So it's probably one of the many kings who ruled parts of Sri Lanka in the ninth century who commissioned and donated this figure um, to a religious institution. But I think the reality is, unfortunately, we may never know who exactly did commission and donate this sculpture. And you also mentioned the damage on the sculpture. So actually, when you're in the gallery itself and you can look very closely at the sides of the figure, you know, running, you know, sort of down your side, top to bottom, vertically, it looks very much like a tide mark. Um, and, you know, based on that, it... It, you know, it looks as though Tara was half buried, face down for quite a long time, um, centuries um, and centuries rather than, you know, a decade or two. Um, and, you know, you might ask, you know, why face down? What's going on? Um, how could you tell that? It's because the front is far better preserved than the back. But, you know, when and why this happened or for how long, it's really not clear, unfortunately. And um, one suggestion is that she may have been removed from a religious institution, the one where she originally stood, um, and she could have been buried in around the 12th century uh, when Buddhism was reformed in Sri Lanka. So, I mean, very broadly speaking, before this period, there were lots of different Buddhist traditions on the island of Sri Lanka, including Mahayana Buddhism, which includes the idea of the Bodhisattva, who, as we mentioned before, is a being who delays their enlightenment in order to help others on the path to enlightenment. And from the 12th century onwards, um, there were a series of reforms which led to the move 
from lots of different Buddhist traditions in Sri Lanka to one main Theravada tradition. And in Theravada Buddhism, this focuses very much on the Buddha's uh, teachings. So it may have been during this period that many of the Mahayana sculptures of the Bodhisattvas and Buddhist deities of Tara were removed from religious institutions. And it's certainly notable that you know, during the ninth-ish centuries and you know, a couple of centuries either way, there are quite a lot of Mahayana Buddhist uh, sculptures which are found, mostly small bronzes, you know, perhaps even you know, say the size of you know, your palm. They're not enormous, but there are quite a lot of them. But afterwards, they tend slowly to disappear from the sculptural uh, record. Um, so that's very, very broadly um, an idea of what, what we think may have happened to her. She was donated to the museum in the 1830s. Why wasn't she put on display immediately? Well, <laughs> so the sculpture was donated to the museum in about 1830 by Sir Robert Brownrigg. And he had been the British governor of Ceylon, which is now called Sri Lanka, as we all know, between 1812 and 1820. And at the time in 1830, when she arrived at the museum, you know, what we consider her beautifully voluptuous figure, the large exposed breasts and curvaceous hips draped in that gorgeous fabric, was thought actually slightly too sexual and erotic to be displayed publicly. So she was placed in the storerooms for about 30 years, um, although she wasn't entirely locked away. I mean, you, know, you could go and view her, you know, scholars could go and view her by request. And I've actually um, got in touch with my uh, former colleague, um, who's now retired, Richard Blurton, to find out if he knows a bit more about this um, story, because I'm really keen to know more as well. But from what I understand, um, she was put on public display uh, soon afterwards, and she's remained on public display until today. She has a very prominent pa uh, place in our gallery. Um, and I think just to add, Tara was not depicted in this um, way to titillate. That's really not what it was about. It's very much a focus for Buddhist meditation. Um, and I think, you know, for different audiences, that's not always apparent because we all come from different traditions. We all um, see and understand things in very different ways. So when she first arrived at the museum, she was thought of as, you know, oh my goodness, slightly too much. But I think people know and understand a lot better now here. So yeah, I don't think it's necessary to spare our blushes anymore. No. <laughs> She is beautiful, definitely worth coming and having a look at her. Um, our sixth object dates back to the Mughal dynasty in India, and it's a haka bowl. And this object is one of my favourites. It's beautiful. The museum holds two identical bowls, which were made in India around 1700. Each bowl is about 20 centimetres high, and if you cup the bowl in your hands, your hands will be about 30 centimetres apart and it closes in at the top to a short neck. And each one is mounted on an ornate golden stand about 40 centimetres high. A hooker is a water pipe which is used for smoking a type of tobacco, and this bowl would have held scented water. The body of the bowl is made of jade, white nephrite jade, which is translucent. The design on it is a simple repeating pattern of stylized flowers and leaves formed of tiny pieces of blue lapis lazuli, dark green jade, and red rubies. Each piece is inlaid into the white jade, and then it's surrounded with a narrow outline of gold. The detailed craftsmanship is extraordinary. And a row of tiny rubies is set into the top of the narrow neck. It's exquisite. I think I like these bowls so much because they remind me of the Taj Mahal. I had no idea until I saw it that the white marble of that beautiful building is also inlaid with tiny flowers made of semi-precious stones. The bowls mounted on a highly decorative stand. This wasn't added until nearly a hundred years later and someone must have decided that it would be an improvement. The mount was made in France in 1798 and it's in complete contrast to the bowl. It's made of green marble and ormolu which is gilded bronze. The design is three-sided and unrealistic. The bowl rests amongst green leaves on the top of three tall palm trees about 30 centimetres high. The leaves and the trunks are of dark green bronze. Everything else is gilded, including three birds standing on the palm leaves with spread wings. At the base of each of the three palm trees is a woman sitting on a cushion with her back to the other two. 
They are identical, so I'll just describe one of them. She's wearing flimsy, clinging draperies. She has a headdress like a turban, topped with a high ornament the shape of a closed fan, and a veil cascades down her back. She's adorned with jewellery. Her arms are raised and wound around the slender trunk of one of the palm trees, which appears to be growing out of a cushion placed on her lap. Her feet are resting on a small platform of dark green marble, which is supported on the back of a camel with a comical smile. Each camel is crouching on a larger platform of green marble, which is supported on three flattened gold balls. Additional decorations around the base and on each side include several golden griffins and a swagged curtain with a fringe and tassels. The mystery for me is how these two pieces, the amazingly beautiful bowl and the extravagant glittering base, ever came to be put together. Shushma, how did that happen? They just seem so mismatched. <laughs> That's a really good question. I've thought the same thing myself. Um, in this case, I'm afraid I just don't know. I don't know how these bases came to be repurposed in a stand like this. Um, but I suppose, you know, thinking more widely into things we may all have um, encountered during our lives, whether visiting a museum or a church or somewhere else, it's really normal for objects to be repurposed in different ways by different people, either over time as needs, requirements and fashions change, or even across different cultures where a particular object uh, may be used and admired in different ways and for different reasons. And this also happens in architecture. So in museums and churches, for example, you might find you know roman cameos found um, which are set into a cross for the altar or mounted into reliquary containers and so i think actually when we think about objects being in and of themselves the same as when they were uh, originally created maybe we're expecting too much because when i bring something into my house i often use to change the use of it um, a pen pot might turn into a, a stand for my makeup brushes you know i think i think that's quite normal i mean in this case i when you see them from a distance they look incredible and the closer you get like myself laughing at the crazy detail of the stands at the bottom because actually the more you look at them the more disjointed they seem so it's a it's a bizarre thing I would be fascinated to know what led to this um, juxtaposition and also how people um, I don't know, it interpreted and understood them when they were maybe displayed on a table or a side table or however they were shown. Thank you for trying to explain that. Trying. <laughs> I'm as confused as you are about that one. Um, we also have now a shadow puppet of Gandhi, which is the last ob object on our tour um, from India, but we it was made in the 1900s. It's a shadow puppet of Mahatma Gandhi, who led the campaign for Indian independence. It's life-size and it's immediately recognizable. It's a really good likeness. Now Gandhi wasn't very tall, so it's about five foot or just over 150 centimeters. It's flat and it's made of translucent calf skin stretched over the shape of the head and limbs. There are pins at each joint so that the arms and the legs can move independently. The calfskin has been slightly tinted and it's darker on his head and upper body where his ribs are clearly visible. The artist has given him a serious expression with wrinkles on his forehead. Gandhi's virtually bald with a small grey moustache. He's got quite large ears and alert brown eyes behind round glasses. He's wearing a white cotton loincloth and flat sandals. The sandals have a wide leather strap across the instep and are facing, um, sorry, I was going to say his, both of his feet are facing towards the right and they've got the wide leather strap and a small loop around his big toe and he's holding a red flower in each hand. I'm not sure exactly how it was manipulated. There's one rod it, extending like a spine through the middle of the figure which was presumably held by the puppeteer. Shushma, can you tell us more about it? How did it work and when would it have been used? Yes, absolutely. So 
This shadow puppet was made in Andhra Pradesh as part of the Tholu Bomalata tra tradition of traveling shadow puppet theater. Um, this is a really ancient tradition in India. And although I suppose the Southeast Asian tradition of shadow puppetry is maybe better known um, worldwide, the Indian tradition is actually older and the progenitor of what's seen in Southeast Asia. So shadow puppet shows have been going on in India for many centuries. Um, as you mentioned, this puppet is made from leather and generally the shadow puppets are made from leather, usually goat, cow or buffalo skin. And in Andhra, the puppets are sometimes more than five feet high, just like this puppet of Gandhi. And also like this one, they are translucent, stained in vegetable dyes and usually, unlike this one, very stylized. And just to give a bit of um, context into shadow puppets and how that would work. So these shadow puppets are viewed from behind a lamp lit uh, cloth screen and the puppets are moved with the help of bamboo st sticks attached at certain points and they usually at joints on the shoulders, knees, elbows and the head as well. Um, the performance is really highly animated and there are usually drums beating out a rhythm to accompany the performance and the story is loudly narrated as the puppets move. The puppeteers travel from village to village and town to town to perform their shadow theatre and usually they tell stories from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the local folk tales, but also they do tell um, other major stories and share news. And, you know, before widespread access to TV and radio, this was one of the most important ways that news and stories were spread. So this shadow puppet of Gandhi would have been made and used to tell his story and India's, India's national story about independence to local audiences across Andhra Pradesh. Now, these days, shadow puppetry still continues, but as you can probably imagine, it's under quite serious threat by film, TV, and I suppose to a slightly lesser extent, radio as well. Um, and I guess also just to add that in you know, different parts of India, different mediums are used to tell stories and share information and on display in another part of the gallery, we have the Ghazi scroll. Now, this is a long scroll of paper. It's been painted with scenes from the lives of miracle working uh, Muslim beers or saints, including Ghazi beer, who this particular scroll is named after. And that scroll was made in Bengal in about 1800. And it was also used by traveling storytellers to tell and share the story of the beers. So this idea of storytelling is part of a much bigger tradition in India. But I think it's also interesting to note that a lot of people aren't aware of these traditions. Because I remember we, gosh, a couple of years ago now, we got a complaint by email um, from, um, from some people. Also, I, I think they were um, British South Asians, actually. And they said that they didn't like this uh, particular puppet being on display because it almost made a mockery, they said, of Mahatma Gandhi. But I think that's to really misunderstand the point of the shadow puppet tradition. It's not about mockery. It's about sharing news. It's about sharing stories. And it's not just the old religious and folk tales um, and stories um, to share. It's also, as I mentioned, it's about news. It's about the really important events in the history of India and South Asia as well. So I think, you know, there's, there's so much going on in the, and it's such, a, such an enormous story you can tell just through this single shadow puppet. Thank you, Shashma. Well, that's the seven objects that we were going to describe to you today and talk about. And we're now going to hand you back to Fiona to see if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was fascinating. I really enjoyed uh, that talk. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, there's still time, hopefully, for a few more if you wanted to put them in the uh, question and answer box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The first question is a question about the coins, um, the dinaras, and the question is, were these dinaras clipped? And if so, is this a common, was this common? I don't know if this is something that you, Shushma, may be able to respond to. So whether they were clipped and whether that might be um, something that you, you've seen before. Um, I, I don't think I know a he, I mean, from the coins that I've seen, the ones in the museum's collection, they tend not to be clipped, but I think it's probably because they were found in a hoard mm -hmm. um, and they were found whole in a hoard. 
but I'm afraid in all honesty, I don't know. Personally, I haven't seen a lot of these kind of coins that were clipped, but I, I you know, just like other silver coins, I imagine some of them were, you know, later on used for their gold content rather than just as coins. Great, thank you. Um, the next question was uh, regarding the statue of Shiva and just saying, uh, the question was, what do the 23 th uh, flames around the rim symbolise? Do these have a particular, uh, are they particularly symbolic? Um, the question yeah, I mean, yes, they are. I mean, when when you look at a sculpture, um, uh, sort of a, a particular of, of a particular religious tradition, I think you can probably it's probably safe to assume that pretty much everything on it does represent something. But I think it's also important to recognise that people interpret a lot of these different parts of symbolism in quite different ways. Um, we might assume that we know absolutely everything and we will interpret everything in exactly the same way, but that's not always the case. I mean, in terms of the flames around the Nataraja, generally they're thought to represent the destructive energy um, with which she was sort of dancing at the end of each of the cosmic ages. You know, he's cleansing um, all the negativity, he's removing illusion, and I think it really emphasises the power um, of his dance, and it's the flames, the amount of energy that's radiating out as well. So yes, I mean, ev every part of this is, is very symbolic. Sorry, just, uh, uh, I'm muting myself. Um, there was a question here, which I'm not quite sure I understand. Um, gemstones would have been used in the Taurus statue we saw earlier. Um, I'm not sure what that refers to, but I thought I'd read it in case it was ringing any bells for, for you. So, oh, Does that mean the Taurus sculpture, do you think? Oh, is it the, uh, the Tara. Okay, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, so is that a question asking whether there's gemstones that are, are also incorporated into that and I've just put the Tara image of Tara up on the screen. Yes, yes, I think it's safe to assume that yes they, they would have been. Um, in fact you'll see them with quite a lot of kind of sculptures in Sri Lanka actually. Um, often they're missing but actually often if you um, zoom in really closely around in her hair um, there's a large gap but also there's like a whole uh, array of smaller holes around it and that is likely to have had gemstones, semi-precious stones um, inlaid in, into that, yes. Okay, fantastic. All right, well I think um, that's probably all we've got time for actually because we're coming up um, towards the end of our um, session. So I just wanted to um, take a few moments to say thank you very, very much to Shushma Jansari and Di Langford from Vocalize uh, who have been taking us through this talk today. Um, I, uh, uh, if anybody had any questions or had any particular comments, there is a feedback form that's going to pop up at, at the end of this session. So that's a survey monkey form. And if you've got time to fill that out, that would be much appreciated. Because like I said, we're new to kind of taking this program online. Uh, you can also email access at britishmuseum.org or there's a phone, uh, phone line as well, which is 0207 323 8971. And that's the access uh, phone line. So if you had particular comments around how we can improve the accessibility of these sessions, we'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, and similarly, if you'd be interested in having a longer chat with our external evaluators, so lots and lots of evaluation, but we really want to make sure that we're getting this right, um, you, you can get in touch at that email access at britishmuseum.org and um, we can have longer conversations with people if anybody would be interested in doing that. Um, but I think that's uh, about all from me. Thank you everybody for, for joining us. Um, thank you Shushma and Dai, I'll, um, I'll let you say goodbye and then we'll, um, we'll until next time, we'll, we'll see you again. Brilliant, well say goodbye. Thanks so much for joining us. This was a new, a new thing for me, but I really enjoyed it and I, I, I hope everyone else enjoyed it too. Yes, and I have enjoyed it as well and I've really loved getting to, I, I'm learning such a lot. I've learned such a lot, Shushma, all about these wonderful objects. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.